Russian Conquest of Central Asia. The partially successful conquest of Central Asia by the Russian Empire took place in the second half of the 19th century. The land that became Russian Turkestan and later Soviet Central Asia is now divided between Kazakhstan in the north, Uzbekistan across the center, Kyrgyzstan in the east, Tajikistan in the southeast, and Turkmenistan in the southwest. The area was called Turkestan because most of its inhabitants spoke Turkic languages with the exception of Tajikistan, which speaks an Iranian language. Prologue. In 1556, Russia conquered the Astrakhan Khanate on the north shore of the Caspian Sea. The surrounding area was held by the Nogai Horde. To the east of the Nogais were the Kazakhs, and to the north, between the Volga and Urals, were the Bashkirs. Around this time, some free Cossacks had established themselves on the Ural River. In 1602, they captured Konya Urgench in Kivan territory. Returning laden with loot, they were surrounded by the Kivans and slaughtered. A second expedition lost its way in the snow, starved, and the few survivors were enslaved by the Kivans. There seems to have been a third expedition, which is ill-documented. At the time of Peter the Great, there was a major push southeast. In addition to the Irtish expeditions above, there was the disastrous 1717 attempt to conquer Kiva. Following the Russo-Persian War, Russia briefly occupied the west side of the Caspian Sea. About 1734, another move was planned, which provoked the Bashkir War. Once Bashkiria was pacified, Russia's southeastern frontier was the Orenburg Line, roughly between the Urals and the Caspian Sea, the Siberian Line. By the late 18th century, Russia held a line of forts roughly along the current Kazakhstan border, which is approximately the boundary between forest and steppe. For reference, these forts and foundation dates were Guryev, Uralsk, Orenburg, Orsk, Troitsk, Petropavlovsk, Omsk, Pavlodar, Semipalatinsk, Ust Kamenogorsk. Uralsk was an old settlement of free Cossacks. Orenburg, Orsk, and Troitsk were founded as a result of the Bashkir War about 1740, and this section was called the Orenburg Line. Orenburg was along the base from which Russia watched and tried to control the Kazakh steppe. The four eastern forts were along the Irtish River. After China conquered Xinjiang in 1759, both empires had a few border posts near the current border. Control of the Kazakh Steppe Since the Kazakhs were nomads, they could not be conquered in the normal sense. Instead, Russian control slowly increased. Although the Sunni Muslim Kazakhs had numerous settlements near the Kazakh-Russian border, and although they conducted frequent raids on Russian territory, the Tsardom of Russia only initiated contact with them in 1692 when Peter Fur met with Tauke Muhammad Khan. The Russians slowly began building trading posts along the Kazakh-Russian border over the next 20 years, gradually encroaching into Kazakh territory and displacing the locals. Interactions intensified in 1718 during the reign of Kazakh ruler Abulkair Muhammad Khan, who initially requested the Russians to provide the Kazakh Khanati protection from the rising Dzungar Khanat to the east. Abul Khair's son, Nur Ali Khan, broke the alliance in 1752 and decided to wage war on Russia, while taking the help of the famous Kazakh commander, Nasrullah Naurizbay Bahadur. The rebellion against Russian encroachment went largely in vain, as the Kazakh troops were defeated on the battlefield numerous times. Nur Ali Khan then agreed to rejoin Russian protection with his division of the Khanate, the Junior Jews being autonomous. By 1781, Abul Mansur Khan, who ruled the Middle Jews division of the Kazakh Khanate, also entered the sphere of Russian influence and protection. Like his predecessor, Abul Khair, Abul Mansur also sought better protection against the Qing. He united all three of the Kazakh Juzis and helped them all gain protection under the Russian Empire. During this time, Abul Mansur also made Nazrullah Naurizbay Bahadur, one of his three standard bearers in the Kazakh army. These moves allowed the Russians to penetrate further into the Central Asian heartland 
and interact with other Central Asian states. Swayar Darya southward from the Siberian line, the obvious next step was a line of forts along the Sir Darya eastward from the Aral Sea. This brought Russia into conflict with the Khan of Kokan. In the early 19th century, Kokan began expanding northwest from the Fergana Valley. About 1814, they took Hazrati Turkestan on the Sir Darya, and around 1817, they built Akmachet, White Mosque, further downriver, as well as smaller forts on both sides of Akmachet. The area was ruled by the Beg of Akmachet, who taxed the local Kazakhs who wintered along the river and had recently driven the Karakalpak southward. In peacetime, Akmechet had a garrison of 50 and Julik 40. The Khan of Kiva had a weak fort on the lower part of the river. Khivan Campaign of 1839. Count V.A. Perovsky's winter invasion of Kiva, the first significant attempt to project Russian power deep into the populated areas of Central Asia, suffered a catastrophic failure. The expedition was proposed by Perovsky and agreed upon in St. Petersburg. It took a lot of effort to gather enough supplies and enough camels to transport them. And in one of the coldest winters in the memory of people and animals, many hardships fell. The invasion failed as almost all of the expedition's camels perished, highlighting Russia's dependence on these animals and the Cossacks who raised and herded them. In addition to the humiliation, most of the Russian slaves, whose liberation was one of the alleged goals of the expedition, were freed and brought to Orenburg by British officers. The lesson the Russians learned from this humiliation was that long-distance expeditions didn't work. Instead, they turned to fortresses as the best means of conquering and controlling the grasslands. Russians attacked Kiva four times. Around 1602, some free Cossacks made three raids on Kiva. In 1717, Alexander Bekovich Cherkasky attacked Kiva and was soundly defeated, only a few men escaping to tell the tale. After the Russian defeat in 1839-1840, Kiva was finally conquered by the Russians during the Kievan Campaign of 1873. Advance from the Northeast. The eastern end of the Kazakh steppe was called Semirechye by the Russians. South of this, along the modern Kyrgyz border, the Tian Shan Mountains extend about 640 kilometers or 400 millimeters to the west. Water coming down from the mountains provides irrigation for a line of towns and supports a natural caravan route. South of this mountain projection is the densely populated Fergana Valley, ruled by the Khanate of Kokan. South of Fergana is the Turkestan Range, and then the land the ancients called Bactria. West of the northern range is the great city of Tashkent, and west of the southern range is Tamerlane's old capital, Samarkand. In 1847, Kopal was founded southeast of Lake Balkesh. In 1852, Russia crossed the Ili River and met Kazakh resistance, and next year destroyed the Kazakh fort of Tuchubek. In 1854, they founded Fort Vernoy, Almaty, within sight of the mountains. In 1851, Russia and China signed the Treaty of Kulja to regulate trade along what was becoming a new border. In 1864, they signed the Treaty of Tarbagatai, which approximately established the current Chinese-Kazakh border. The Chinese thereby renounced any claims to the Kazakh steppe, to the extent that they had any. Slow but sure approach. Given Perovsky's failure in 1839, Russia decided on a slow but sure approach. In 1847, Captain Schultz built Raimsk in the Sir Delta. It was soon moved upriver to Kazalinsk. Both places were also called Fort Aralsk. Raiders from Kiva and Kokan attacked the local Kazakhs near the fort and were driven off by the Russians. Three sailing ships were built at Orenburg, disassembled, carried across to steppe and rebuilt. They were used to map the lake. In 1852-3, two steamers were carried in pieces from Sweden and launched on the Aral Sea. The local Saxol proving impractical, they had to be fueled with anthracite brought from the Don. At other times, a steamer would tow a barge load of Saxol and periodically stop to reload fuel. The Seer proved to be shallow, full of sandbars and difficult to navigate during the spring flood. Fall of the Kazakh Khanate. 
By 1837, tensions were rising in the Kazakh steppe once again. This time, the tensions were started by Kazakh co-rulers, Ubaidullah Khan, Shergazi Khan, and Kenesari Khan, all of whom were sons of Qasim Sultan and grandsons of Abul Mansur Khan. They launched a rebellion against Russia. The three co-rulers wanted to restore the relative independence that was present under previous Kazakh rulers, such as Abul Mansur, and they sought to resist taxation by the Russians. In 1841, the three Khans obtained the help of their younger cousin, Aziz Iddin Bahadur, the son of Kazakh commander Nasrullah Naurizbai Bahadur, and gathered a large troop of well-trained Kazakhs to resist the Russian army. The Kazakhs captured a number of Kokan fortresses in Kazakhstan, including their former capital of Hazrati Turkestan. They decided to hide in the mountainous region near Lake Balkhash, but were taken by surprise when a Kyrgyz Khan named Orman Khan disclosed their whereabouts to Russian troops. Gubaidullah, Shergazi, and Kenesari were all captured and executed by Kyrgyz defectors who had been helping the Russians. By the end of 1847, the Russian army had captured the Kazakh capitals of Hazrati Turkestan and Siganak, abolishing the Kazakh Khanate as a whole. Line of Forts In the 1840s and 1850s, the Russians extended their control into the steppes, where after capturing the Kokandi fortress of Akmasjid in 1853, they sought to fortify a new frontier along the Sirdaria River, east of the Aral Sea. The new fortresses of Reim, Kazalinsk, Karmakchi, and Parovsk were islands of Russian sovereignty in a desolate landscape of salt marshes, swamps, and deserts, subject to extreme cold and heat. Supplying the garrison proved difficult and expensive, and the Russians became dependent on the Bukhara grain merchants and Kazakh cattle breeders and fled to the outpost in Kokan. The Sir Darya border was a fairly effective base for eavesdropping on Russian intelligence, repelling attacks from Kokan, but neither Cossacks nor peasants were convinced to settle there, and the costs of occupation far exceeded the income. By the end of the 1850s, there were calls for a withdrawal to the Orenburg Front, but the usual argument, the argument of prestige, won out, and instead, the best way out of this particularly painful place was an attack on Tashkent. Up the Sir Darya. Meanwhile, Russia was advancing southeast up the Sir Darya from Akmachet. In 1859, Yulik was taken from Kokand. In 1861, a Russian fort was built at Julik and Yani Kurgan, Jana Korgan, 80 km, 50 mil reciters. A river was taken. In 1862, Chernyev reconnoitered the river as far as Hazrati Turkestan and captured the small oasis of Suzak, about 105 km 65 meter, east of the river. In June 1864, Veryovkin took Hazrati Turkestan from Kokand. He hastened surrender by bombarding the famous mausoleum. Two Russian columns met in the 200 km 150 meter gap between Hazrat and Aliata, thereby completing the Sir Darya line. Fall of Tashkent. For some historians, the conquest of Central Asia begins in 1865 with the fall of Tashkent to General Chernyayev. In fact, this was the culmination of a series of steppe campaigns which had begun in the 1840s, but it did mark the point at which the Russian Empire moved from the steppe to the settled zone of southern Central Asia. Tashkent was Central Asia's largest city and a major trading entrepot, but it has long been argued that Chernyayev disobeyed orders when he captured the city. Chernyav's apparent disobedience was really a product of the ambiguity of his instructions, and above all of Russian ignorance of the geography of the region, which meant the war ministry was convinced a natural frontier would somehow present itself when it was needed. After Aliada, Chimkent, and Turkestan had fallen to Russian forces, Chernyav was instructed to separate Tashkent from the influence of Kokand. While not quite the daring coup de main of legend, Chernyav's assault was risky and resulted in two days of fighting in the streets before he reached an accommodation with the Tashkent Ulama. War with Bukhara After Tashkent's fall, General M. G. Chernyav 
became the first governor of the new province of Turkestan and immediately began lobbying to keep the city under Russian rule and to embark on further conquests. An apparent threat from Said Muzaffar, Amir of Bukhara, provided him with a justification for further military action. In February 1866, Chernayev crossed the Hungry Steppe to the Bokharan fort of Jizek. Finding the task impossible, he withdrew to Tashkent, followed by Bokharans, who were soon joined by Kokandis. At this point, Chernayev was recalled for insubordination and replaced by Romanovsky. Romanovsky prepared to attack Bokhara. The Emir moved first. The two forces met on the plain of Irjar. The Bukharians scattered, losing most of their artillery, supplies, and treasures, and more than 1,000 killed, while the Russians lost 12 wounded. Instead of following him, Romanovsky turned east and took Kujan, thus closing the mouth of the Fergana Valley. Then he moved west and launched unauthorized assaults on Uratepe and Jizak from Bukhara. Defeats forced Bukhara to start peace talks. Russians take Samarkand. In July 1867, a new province of Turkestan was created and placed under General von Kaufmann with its headquarters at Tashkent. The Bukharan Amir did not fully control his subjects. There were random raids and rebellions. So Kaufmann decided to hasten matters by attacking Samarkand. After he dispersed a Bokharan force, Samarkand closed its gates to the Bokharan army and surrendered, May 1868. He left a garrison in Samarkand and left to deal with some outlying areas. The garrison was besieged and in great difficulty until Kaufmann returned. On June 1668, in a decisive battle on the Zerabulak Heights, the Russians defeated the main forces of the Bukhara Emir, losing less than 100 people, while the Bukhara army lost from 3.5 to 10,000. On 5th of July, 1868, a peace treaty was signed. The Khanate of Bukhara lost Samarkand and remained a semi-independent vassal until the revolution. The Khanate of Kokan had lost its western territory, was confined to the Fergana Valley and surrounding mountains and remained independent for about 10 years. According to the Bregel's Atlas, if nowhere else, in 1870, the now vassal Khanate of Bokhara expanded east and annexed that part of Bactria enclosed by the Turkestan Range, the Pamir Plateau, and the Afghan border. Battle of Zerabulak. The battle on the Zerabulak Heights is the decisive battle of the Russian army under the command of General Kaufman with the army of the Bukhara Emir Muzaffar which took place in June 1868 on the slopes of the Zeratau mountain range between Samarkand and Bukhara. It ended with the defeat of the Bukhara army and the transition of the Bukhara Emirate to vassal dependence on the Russian Empire. Kievan Campaign of 1873. Twice before, Russia had failed to subjugate Kiva. In 1717, Prince Bekovich Cherkovsky marched from the Caspian and fought the Kievan army. The Kievans lulled him by diplomacy, then slaughtered his entire army, leaving almost no survivors. In the Kievan campaign of 1839, Count Porovsky marched south from Orenburg. The unusually cold winter killed most of the Russian camels, forcing them to turn back. By 1868, the Russian conquest of Turkestan had captured Tashkent and Samarkand and gained control over the Khanates of Kokand in the eastern mountains and Bukhara along the Oxus River. This left a roughly triangular area east of the Caspian, south of the and north of the Persian border. The Khanate of Kiva was at the north end of this triangle. In December 1872, the Tsar made the final decision to attack Kiva. The force would be 61 infantry companies, 26 of Cossack cavalry, 54 guns, four mortars, and five rocket detachments. Kiva would be approached from five directions. General von Kaufmann, in supreme command, would march west from Tashkent and meet a second force moving south from Fort Oralsk. The two would meet in the middle of the Kaizilkum Desert at Min Bulak and move southwest to the head of the Oxus Delta. Meanwhile, Veryovkin would go south from Orenburg along the west side of the Aral Sea and meet Lomakin coming directly east from the Caspian Sea, while Markozov 
would march northeast from Krasnovodsk, later changed to Chikishliar. The reason for this odd plan may have been bureaucratic rivalry. The governor of Orenburg had always had primary responsibility for Central Asia. Kaufman's newly conquered Turkestan province had many active officers, while the viceroy of the Caucasus had by far the most troops. Veryovkin was at the northwest corner of the delta and Kaufman at the south corner. But it was not until June 4th and 5 that messengers brought them into contact. Veryovkin took command of Lomakin's troops and left Kungard on May 27th, taking Kojali 55 miles south and Mangit 35 miles southeast of that. Because of some firing from the village, Mangit was burned and the inhabitants slaughtered. The Kievans made a number of attempts to stop them. By June 7th, he was on the outskirts of Kiva, two days before he had learned that Kaufman had crossed the Oxus. On June 9th, an advanced party came under heavy fire and found that they had unwittingly reached the north gate of the city. They took a barricade and called for scaling ladders, but Veryovkin called them back, intending only a bombardment. During the engagement, Veryovkin was wounded in the right eye. The bombardment began, and an envoy arrived at 4 p.m. offering capitulation. Because firing from the walls did not stop, the bombardment was resumed, and soon parts of the city were on fire. Bombardment stopped again at 11 p.m., when a message arrived from Kaufman saying that the Khan had surrendered. The next day, some Turkmen began firing from the walls, the artillery opened up, and a few lucky shots smashed the gate. Skobolev and 1,000 men rushed through and were near the Khan's place when they learned that Kaufman was peacefully entering through the West Gate. He pulled back and waited for Kaufman. Liquidation of the Kokan Khanate. In 1875, the Kokan Khanate rebelled against Russian rule. Kokan commanders Abdurakman and Pulat Bey seized power in the Khanate and began military operations against the Russians. By July 1875, most of the Khan's army and much of his family had deserted to the rebels. So he fled to the Russians at Koyent, along with a million British pounds of treasure. Kaufman invaded the Khanate on September 1st, fought several battles and entered the capital on September 10th, 1875. In October, he transferred command to Mikhail Skobolev. Russian troops under the command of Skobolev and Kaufman defeated the rebels at the Battle of Makram. In 1876, the Russians freely entered Kokand. The leaders of the rebels were executed and the Khanate was abolished. Fergana Oblast was created in its place. First Battle of Georg Tepe. The First Battle of Georg Tepe, 1879, occurred during the Russian conquest of Turkestan, marking a significant conflict against the Akalteka Turkmens. Following Russia's victories over the Emirate of Bukhara, 1868, and the Khanate of Kiva, 1873, the Turkoman desert nomads remained independent, inhabiting an area bordered by the Caspian Sea, the Oxus River, and the Persian border. The Teka Turkomans, primarily agriculturalists, were located near the Kopet Dog Mountains, which provided a natural defense alongside the oasis. In the lead up to the battle, General Lazarev replaced the previously unsuccessful Nikolai Lomakin, assembling a force of 18,000 men and 6,000 camels at Chikishliar. The plan involved a march through the desert towards the Ahal Oasis, aiming to establish a supply base at Koja Kale before attacking Georg Tepe. The logistical challenges were significant, including slow supply landings at Chikishliar and the hardships of desert travel during an unfavorable season. Despite preparations, the campaign faced early setbacks with Lazarev's death in August, leading Lomakin to take command. Lomakin's advance began with a crossing of the Kopet Dog Mountains and a march towards Georg Tepe, known locally as Denghil Tepe. Upon reaching the fortress, densely populated with defenders and civilians, Lomakin initiated a bombardment. The assault on September 8th was poorly executed, lacking in preparations such as scaling ladders and sufficient infantry, leading to heavy casualties on both sides. The Turkmen, led by Berdi Murad Khan, who was killed during the battle, managed to repel the Russian forces despite significant losses. The Russian retreat marked a failed attempt at conquering Georg Tepe, with Lomakin's tactics criticized for their haste and lack of strategic planning. 
resulting in unnecessary bloodshed. The Russians suffered 445 casualties, while the Techies had approximately 4,000 casualties, killed and wounded. The aftermath saw General Turgukasov replacing Lazarev and Lomakin, with most Russian troops withdrawing to the west side of the Caspian by year's end. This battle exemplified the challenges faced by imperial powers in conquering Central Asian territories, highlighting the logistical difficulties, the fierce resistance of local populations, and the consequences of military mismanagement. Battle of Gyok Tepe. The Battle of Gyok Tepe in 1881, also known as Dengil Tepe or Dangil Tepe, was a decisive conflict in the 1881 Russian campaign against the Teke tribe of Turkmens, leading to Russian control over most of modern Turkmenistan and nearing the completion of Russia's conquest of Central Asia. The fortress of Giyok Tepe, with its substantial mud walls and defenses, was located in the Akal Oasis, an area supported by agriculture due to irrigation from the Kopet Dog Mountains. After a failed attempt in 1879, Russia, under Mikhail Skobolev's command, prepared for a renewed offensive. Skobolev opted for a siege strategy over a direct assault, focusing on logistical buildup and slow, methodical advance. By December 1880, Russian forces were positioned near Geok Tepe, with significant numbers of infantry, cavalry, artillery, and modern military technologies, including rockets and heliographs. The siege began in early January 1881, with Russian troops establishing positions and conducting reconnaissance to isolate the fortress and cut off its water supply. Despite several Turkmen sorties, which inflicted casualties but also resulted in heavy losses for the Techies, the Russians made steady progress. On January 23rd, a mine filled with explosives was placed under the fort's walls, leading to a major breach the following day. The final assault on January 24th started with a comprehensive artillery barrage, followed by the explosion of the mine, creating a breach through which Russian forces entered the fortress. Despite initial resistance and a smaller breach proving difficult to penetrate, Russian troops managed to secure the fortress by afternoon, with the Techies fleeing and pursued by Russian cavalry. The battle's aftermath was brutal. Russian casualties for January were over a thousand, with significant ammunition expended. Tekka losses were estimated at 20,000. The capture of Ashgabat followed on January 30th, marking a strategic victory, but at the cost of heavy civilian casualties, leading to Skobolev's removal from command. The battle and subsequent Russian advances solidified their control over the region, with the establishment of Transcaspia as a Russian oblast and the formalization of borders with Persia. The battle is commemorated in Turkmenistan as a national day of mourning and symbol of resistance, reflecting on the heavy toll of the conflict and the enduring impact on Turkmen national identity. The Annexation of Mir The Trans-Caspian Railway reached Kizil Arbat at the northwest end of the Kopet Dag in mid-September 1881. From October through December, Lesser surveyed the north side of the Kopet Dag and reported that there would be no problem building a railway along it. From April 1882, he examined the country almost to Herat and reported that were no military obstacles between the Kopet Dog and Afghanistan. Nazirov, or Nazir Beg, went to Merv in disguise and then crossed the desert to Bukhara and Tashkent. The irrigated area along the Kopet Dag ends east of Ashgabat. Farther east, there is desert, then the small oasis of Tejent, more desert, and the much larger oasis of Merv. Merv had the great fortress of Kaushut Khan and was inhabited by Merv Tekis, who had also fought at Geok Tepe. As soon as the Russians were established in Askabad, traders and also spies began moving between the Kopet Dog and Merv. Some elders from Merv went north to Petro Aleksandrovsk and offered a degree of submission to the Russians there. The Russians at Askabad had to explain that both groups were part of the same empire. In February 1882, Alikhanov visited Merv and approached Makhdum Kuli Khan, who had been in command at Georg Tepe. In September, Alikhanov persuaded Makhdum Kuli Khan to swear allegiance to the White Tsar. Skobolev had been replaced by Rohrberg in the spring of 1881, 
who was followed General Komarov in the spring of 1883. Near the end of 1883, General Komarov led 1,500 men to occupy the Tejan Oasis. After Komarov's occupation of Tejan, Ali Khanov and Makhdum Kuli Khan went to Merv and called a meeting of elders, one threatening and the other persuading. Having no wish to repeat the slaughter at Georg Tepe, 28 elders went to Askabad and on February 12th swore allegiance in the presence of General Komarov. A faction in Merv tried to resist, but was too weak to accomplish anything. On March 16, 1884, Komarov occupied Merv. The subject Kanadis of Kiva and Bukhara were now surrounded by Russian territory. Pan JDH Incident. The Panjde Incident, known in Russian historiography as the Battle of Kushka, was an armed engagement between the Emirate of Afghanistan and the Russian Empire in 1885 that led to a diplomatic crisis between the British Empire and the Russian Empire regarding the Russian expansion southeastwards towards the Emirate of Afghanistan and the British Raj, India. After nearly completing the Russian conquest of Central Asia, Russian Turkestan, the Russians captured an Afghan border fort, threatening British interests in the area. Seeing this as a threat to India, Britain prepared for war, but both sides backed down and the matter was settled diplomatically. The incident halted further Russian expansion in Asia, except for the Pamir Mountains, and resulted in the definition of the northwestern border of Afghanistan. Pamirs occupied the southeast corner of Russian Turkestan was the High Pamirs, which is now the gorno badakhshan Autonomous Region of Tajikistan. The high plateaus on the east are used for summer pasture. On the west side, difficult gorges run down to the Panj River and Bactria. In 1871, Alexei Pavlovich Fechenko got the Khan's permission to explore southward. He reached the Alay Valley, but his escort would not permit him to go south onto the Pamir Plateau. In 1876, Skobolev chased a rebel south to the Alay Valley, and Kostenko went over the Kizilar Pass and mapped the area around Karakul Lake on the northeast part of the plateau. In the next 20 years, most of the area was mapped. In 1891, the Russians informed Francis Younghus Band that he was on their territory and later escorted a Lieutenant Davidson out of the area, Pamir incident. In 1892, a battalion of Russians under Mikhail Yonov entered the area and camped near the present Murgab, Tajikistan in the Northeast. Next year, they built a proper fort there, Pamirsky Post. In 1895, their base was moved west to Korok, facing the Afghans. In 1893, the Durand Line established the Wakhan Corridor between the Russian Pamirs and British India. Epilogue. The Great Game refers to British attempts to block Russian expansion southeast toward British India. Although there was much talk of a possible Russian invasion of India, and a number of British agents and adventurers penetrated Central Asia, the British did nothing serious to prevent the Russian conquest of Turkestan, with one exception. Whenever Russian agents approached Afghanistan, they reacted very strongly, seeing Afghanistan as a necessary buffer state for the defense of India. A Russian invasion of India seems improbable, but a number of British writers considered how it might be done. When little was known about the geography, it was thought that they could reach Kiva and sail up the Oxus to Afghanistan. More realistically, they might gain Persian support and cross northern Persia. Once in Afghanistan, they would swell their armies with offers of loot and invade India. Alternatively, they might invade India and provoke a native rebellion. The goal would probably not be the conquest of India, but to put pressure on the British, while Russia did something more important, such as taking Constantinople. The Great Game came to an end with the demarcation of the northern Afghan border in 1886 and 1893 and the Anglo-Russian Entente of 1907.